Time for all the latest now with the ITV News at 10. Young, unvaccinated and in hospital with COVID. How the under 35s now account for a fifth of admissions. That rate is four times higher than during the winter surge. We speak to one 30-something struggling to breathe and still struggling to decide whether he should have got the jab. Why Why didn't you get vaccinated? Because um, it's, it's still something that I was, you know, I don't know, investigating, considering. The figures could be a sign the vaccines are working, but young adults were urged again today to join the jabbed masses and not the critically ill. Also on News at 10. Desperate times in Bangladesh. We report from the latest country to be hit badly by the Delta variant. He said, what now? Anger as Boris Johnson jokes that Margaret Thatcher helped the climate by closing down the mines. He's here, Man City announced they've signed Jack Grealish, making him the most expensive player bought by a Premier League club. Plus... Fortune favours the bold, and there were none bolder than Walls in this one. What a way to win. Matt Walls confidently clinches Team GB's first track cycling gold in Tokyo. This is ITV News at 10 with Nina Hussain. Hello, good evening. If proof were needed of the risks to some young people of not having the COVID vaccines, you only need to look in some of the country's COVID wards. That's what we've been doing in the first hospital to declare a critical incident even before the first lockdown had begun. In Northwick Park Hospital in Harrow in the northwest of London, we found those who thought it wouldn't happen to them hooked up to oxygen. Doctors there say this summer is turning out to be busier than a normal winter. And today, NHS England said that a fifth of all COVID patients are now aged between 18 and 34. So familiar is this sight, it is hard not to be indifferent. But one look at the inside of an acute hospital ward with dozens of COVID patients tells you the virus and deaths from it has not gone away. And it's the unvaccinated young who are now suffering. When you reach that stage where you don't feel like you're breathing properly, it's an issue. And it was worrying. Thought you might die. 100%. Alan wasn't vaccinated. He wanted to wait to weigh up his options, but he ended up here and 10 days later is still unwell. Do you regret that now? I'm not saying I regret, but like I said, with the whole vaccination stuff and all of that, like I said, I still have to kind of make sure everything is comfortable enough to say you're going to do this or you're going to do that or you're going to make that decision. His consultant at Northwick Park Hospital in London says the unvaccinated has led to a rise in unnecessary admissions. I would say about 70% of the patients that we're looking after have not had a COVID vaccine. People feel that they weren't susceptible, that they were not at risk of getting COVID. Others have said that they weren't aware that they were eligible for the vaccine. For patients that have not had a vaccine and then developed COVID, some of them do demonstrate regret. NHS analysis shows patients aged 18 to 34 made up more than 20% of those admitted to hospital last month, up from 5.4% at the peak in January. About 1,000 young adults are currently in a critical condition, four times higher than the winter peak, although most older adults hadn't been fully vaccinated. Although they're coping with the number of COVID patients here on this ward, it's what's happening downstairs in A&E and other parts of the hospital that's the real worry. More and more patients arriving with more advanced illnesses that need a bed and need care. Hi, I'm just going to take your blood pressure and stuff test. Gary's been having chest pain for four days. He needs an x-ray, despite being reluctant to come today because it was so busy. I haven't been to the doctors or anything for 15 years. I just don't go. 
but I, I don't get ill like normally. So it took a lot for me to come here today, put it that way. Pressures on A&E are as high as they were before the pandemic. An endless stream of patients means staff here are constantly juggling resources and moving wards around. We are super busy at the moment. We just hit our January type attendance numbers and it's a huge mix of COVID and non-COVID, which makes it sort of triply complicated for us right now. This hospital was overwhelmed during the first wave of the virus. It is nowhere near as busy with COVID patients now, but any more, and the knock-on effect could be worrying. Emily Morgan, News at 10, at Northwick Park Hospital in London. There's been a big fall in the number of the dreaded pings ringing out on people's mobile phones. In the last week of July, just short of 400,000 people in England and Wales were advised that way to self-isolate. The previous week, it was nearly 700,000. So are cases really falling that much or are people just deleting the app? Certainly, they are using it less to check into pubs, restaurants, libraries and so on. Getting life completely back to normal over the last 18 months or so has almost felt a world away. As restrictions have now been eased, the so-called pandemic has slowed down the return of normality. Here at Beck and Scott in Buckinghamshire, at the oldest original model village in the world, families had conflicting views about the notifications from the NHS Test and Trace app. It's all for a good reason, it's all for a good reason, but not ideal, it can't carry on for forever. Yeah, it seems um, a lot less people um, are getting pinged and I'm, I'm optimistic. The number of alerts sent by the NHS COVID app in England and Wales has fallen by more than 40% in a week. Nearly 400,000 alerts were sent in the week to July 28th, down from nearly 700,000 in the previous seven days. Meanwhile, almost 200,000 people tested positive for COVID. That's down 39% on the previous week. This scientist believes it is that reduction in cases that has led to the number of pings falling. As cases have gone down, you very much expect that the number of pinged people would go down by more because more people are in contact with an individual than just one case. There are, however, concerns that people are deleting the app or not using it properly. Andre Smith owns this nightclub and bar in Norwich and he is encouraging punters to switch it off when they come to visit. We can't live in fear of something forever. There has to be a result. There has to be a, a, a happy middle ground where people can start to get back to some form of normality without thinking, are we going to then have to go back into lockdown or isolation every time we go out? The latest data also shows there's been a decrease in the number of check-ins to venues on the app. But the government will hope people continue to use it properly so we can work efficiently as we move out of the pandemic. Shihab Khan, News at 10, Westminster. Some positive signs in Shehab's report, but uh, as you reported on, some hospitals are under intense pressure. Are some doctors now thinking that, uh, that the real pressure might finally be starting to ease off? Yeah, they're hopeful. Of course they're hopeful. I mean, they're watching the case rates, the hospital admissions just as closely as the rest of us. But I have to say, I sensed real frustration amongst consultants in that hospital, just at how many patients they are seeing who are unvaccinated. I mean, 70% of their patients at the moment had not been immunised. And they say had they been fully vaccinated, a large proportion of them probably wouldn't have needed hospital treatment at all. So I think that's really, really significant. In terms of hopes elsewhere, I've spoken to a number of scientists this week who say that we might be seeing a flattening off of cases. And if that is the case, we could be heading towards what is called the endemic equilibrium. Now, this is where the virus starts to stabilise and case numbers remain constant. So they stop going up dramatically, they stop coming down dramatically. Now, if this is happening, it may be that we won't see another great big surge of infections that would we'll all start to live with this at this level for the next few years and any new infections could be mild or asymptomatic. Now, I think experts are just sitting there waiting, they're watching the data really carefully, but it does appear cases are flattening. It does seem hospital admissions are on the Turn. So if it does stabilise, it could be that normal life for us remains, it begins to resume, but COVID continues to circulate among us. Let's hope uh, that really is the case. <laughs> Emily Morgan, thank you very much. Thank you.
To Bangladesh now, where the Delta strain of COVID first recorded across the border in India is having a devastating effect right now. Infections in Bangladesh are at their highest since the start of the pandemic in March last year. Hospitals in the big cities are overrun, but it is in the vast rural areas where there are no major hospitals that patients are so at risk. The worst affected region is in Raj Arshi province along the border with India. We've been able to film with Red Crescent medics as they do their best to reach those who need urgent treatment. Every day this Red Crescent team is responding to more desperate calls for help. The Delta variant has run rampant through these dank, dense villages in Bangladesh and they try to reach as many patients as possible. They've been getting up to 60 calls a day but can only respond to around 10. Today, Parama's call was answered, giving her 64-year-old husband a chance of survival. A home test confirmed he had the virus, and for four days his breathing and fever have been getting worse. The infection rate in Rajshahi has been as high as 50%. It is highly populated and under-resourced. When the Delta variant took hold in India, just across the river from here, they knew it was only a matter of time. And now, as Bangladesh enters an extended lockdown, this city finds itself at the epicentre of an outbreak the country is struggling to contain. Volunteer teams have also stepped in to distribute oxygen. With hospitals beyond capacity, they are attempting critical care in the community. That also includes delivering food. Tens of thousands of families who have lost their source of income are being provided with cooked meals and other provisions. The government has responded by securing vaccines from Russia, China, the EU and the US. Currently, only 3% of the population have been fully immunised. It's now a race between the virus and the vaccine. They are yet to reach the peak of this wave, and that means no let up for the Red Crescent team. It's hoped a new lockdown and an urgent effort to get people vaccinated will spare Bangladesh from a complete Delta disaster. Debbie Edward, News at 10. And Debbie joins us now from Beijing. Debbie, clearly a troubling situation there in Bangladesh, but it, it isn't the only country in the region really feeling the impact of the Delta variant now. No, Nina, you've seen our reports from Nepal, and, and this week Indonesia passed the grim milestone of 100,000 coronavirus deaths. Cases there are skyrocketing, with a high percentage of children and young adults being hospitalised. In Myanmar, aid agencies have warned of a spiralling humanitarian catastrophe as it grapples with soaring COVID cases amid the turmoil of a military coup. Vaccinations are at a standstill, testing has collapsed, and hospitals there are are barely functioning. Tonight here in China, millions of people are back in lockdown, quarantined in their homes as cases of the Delta virus rise here. Numbers compared to those other countries I've just mentioned are low, but still mass testing is underway in half of the country's provinces and hundreds of domestic flights and trains have been suspended. The Chinese government's zero tolerance virus policy is now being questioned with doctors here saying it is now time to accept and adapt to the coronavirus in its various forms, being part of our lives for some time to come. Debbie Edward, thank you very much. There's no question that predicting what the economy is going to do next as the UK emerges from COVID restrictions is pretty tricky. Three months ago, the Bank of England predicted inflation would rise to 2.5, would rise to 2.5%. Today, the bank revised that figure upwards to a rather chunkier and worrying 
Inflation hurts. Just ask Stephen Toy. He's back at the wheel of his taxi and trade has picked up. But the strong bounce back in economic activity is creating strong inflation. The price of petrol has risen every month for the last nine months. We're going to get squeezed. I've calculated for myself. It's still going to cost me an extra £500 over the course of next year if fuel prices remain as they are now. If they go even higher than they are now, then we could, you know, it could be 600 plus a year extra. Prices are rising faster than the Bank of England expected, but for now, it's keeping interest rates on hold. Higher inflation is always painful, and that's why we never want to see it. And, and that's why we've got to get through it, manage it as, as, best, you know, as best possible, and make sure that it is only temporary. What makes you think it will be temporary? Well, we've looked at it very carefully, and we've looked at the un, you know, what's causing it. And we think that the underlying causes of it are ones that should go away. Three months ago, the bank forecast that consumer price inflation would reach 2.5% this year. It now thinks it will peak at 4%. In fact, the bank now expects prices to rise faster than pay this year and next, causing a squeeze on living standards. Inflation's being driven higher by increased spending as the economy unlocks, by a surge in the price of oil and other commodities, by supply constraints. A global shortage of semiconductors is restricting car production and by an abundance of vacancies that that many companies say they are struggling to fill. The Bank of England is betting that all these inflationary pressures will subside in the coming months. The danger, of course, is that they don't, that higher prices prompts workers to demand higher wages, which in turn feeds higher prices and so on. There is a risk that the bank will be forced to act to slow the economy by raising interest rates sooner than otherwise expected. As it stands, the markets expect bank rate to start rising at some point next year, but not by much, suggests the governor. I think by any historical standard, the rise, the path of interest rates will be very gradual. But we're living in a world where the sort of what I might call the underlying interest rates are now much lower than they were before. A lot of this is to do with the fact that there's an ageing population in the world that, that, that is saving more for its old age. And that's not going to change. The uplifting news is the bank believes that unemployment has peaked and that the economy will have recovered to its pre-COVID size by the end of this year. At some point, it will have to stop creating money and start withdrawing emergency support. When and how smoothly that happens depends on inflation. Joel Hills, News at 10. In former coal mining communities across Britain, Margaret Thatcher is remembered for the effects on their lives and livelihoods when she closed so many of their mines. This evening, she was remembered by the latest of her successes as Conservative Prime Minister as something of a climate change pioneer. It was thanks to her, Boris Johnson said at the end of his two-day trip to Scotland, that Britain had made an early start to a big reduction in coal-generated power. Peter is uh, in Glasgow tonight. Peter, if this uh, was a joke, it hasn't gone down very well, has it? No, the Prime Minister has a small army of special advisers for trips like this to Scotland. And you can imagine for any Conservative Prime Minister coming here, they channel their inner Basil Fawlty and say, don't mention Margaret Thatcher and the coal mines yet. That's exactly what Boris Johnson has done. And also su suggesting that they should be, people here should be thankful for her shutting those industries that cost thousands of jobs and devastated communities, some of which have still never uh, recovered, um, saying that she did so for environmental reasons. Now, that is, of course, a rewriting of history because she continued to import cheaper coal from overseas, and it has provoked the response she would expect. Labour's Keir Starmer saying it shows Boris Johnson is out of touch. Nicola Sturgeon saying it was crass and deeply insensitive. Now, it's the Edinburgh Comedy Festival this week. If Boris Johnson wanted to crack jokes, he might have waited a couple of more days. But there is a sense here in Scotland that the Scottish Conservatives step back from Boris Johnson. They wince when they hear he's coming. They don't think he's an asset to their cause in Scotland or to Scotland staying in the UK. And his words today back up that perception. Peter Smith, thank you. When 19-year-old law student Aya Hatcham went shopping for food for her family in Blackburn, something truly dreadful happened. She was hit and killed by a bullet fired from a car by a hitman in what was a feud between the owners of rival tyre businesses. Today, the gunman and six accomplices were all jailed for life. Aya's brother said he hoped they rotted in prison. Aya Hashem was on her way to the shops, unaware that she was about to become the innocent victim of a carefully worked out and murderous plot. 
After one gunshot missed its intended target, the second attempt killed Aya almost immediately. The man who had been the target made this 999 call. Yeah, I saw the car, saw the gun, and they started shooting on me. She was just walking around. Is she breathing? No, no, she's not responsive. She's got a very weak pulse. Uh, we're just starting CPI. Today, Aya's family said the murder had changed their lives forever. In my pain, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy or my family's pain. We're going to live the rest of our lives without our angel. I hope these people rot in prison. Today, seven men were each sentenced to at least 27 years in prison for both Aya's murder and the attempted murder of their intended victim. Orchestrator Feroz Suleiman and gunman Zamir Raja will each serve at least 34 years behind bars. The shooting in broad daylight was the culmination of a feud between these two garages. The owner of RI Tyres, Feroz Suleiman, unhappy with the competition from Quick Tyres next door. So unhappy that he hatched what was called an elaborate plan to dispose of his rival. As a specially purchased car drove by with gun at the ready, Suleiman adopted a ringside seat on his forecourt to watch his efforts play out. Stay where you are, yeah? Keep your hands out, all right? I've got a taser, OK? The gunman, who'd agreed a fee of £1,500 for the killing, was arrested at London Euston Station. I'm delighted with the, with the sentencing. Um, there's been months of meticulous and uh, challenging police work. But I think more importantly for me, uh, today was for the family. Today, Aya's relatives gathered at the scene where she died to remember their shining star, a family ripped apart by a petty business rivalry who will never see her smile again. Hannah Miller, News at 10. A murder charge has been brought by police over the death of a five-year-old boy found dead in a river in South Wales on Saturday. Logan Mwangi had gone missing from his home near Bridge End very early that morning. His mother's partner has been charged with Logan's murder. His mother and a 13-year-old boy have also been charged with perverting the course of justice. Fires that have been raging across Turkey and Greece for more than a week are still destroying everything in their path. The island of Evia near Athens has one of Greece's biggest fires today. Where the flames have died down, people have been to see what is left of their homes, if anything. The ground is still smouldering on Evia. This was a children's playground until flames and panic rushed through here yesterday afternoon. I saw it on TV that my school was on fire. Eleni was forced to abandon her languages school here. This is what had confronted her village. Residents left with nowhere to run but the sea. She returned this afternoon to find that two decades of hard work had been devoured in just a few minutes. For me, it's, um, it was all I have. You know, I, I have all my students here. This is my property, this is my job. This, this was my property, my job. And I lost everything right now. And still, Evia burns. Just one of many fronts being fought by Greek firefighters as the relentless heat continues to fuel the flames. A Greek minister has described this operation as a clash of the titans, but for firefighters, it's also a tit-for-tat battle. When they put one fire out, another simply pops up elsewhere. Without support from the air, the difficult terrain would make containing this fire almost impossible. Every 10 minutes, Vasilis watches the aircraft fly over his farm. And the flames move ever closer. It's our livelihood here, so it's threatened. You're sad about the people that you know, that they lost uh, their, their houses, their fortunes, their work and uh, all around the general feeling of uh, pes pessimism. That pessimism is shared by the Greek Prime Minister, who's called this an unprecedented environmental crisis. With the outskirts of Athens, as well as this island, threatened with further destruction, he's warned there are still many difficult days ahead. Ben Chapman, News at 10, Evia, Greece. Yet more dinghies packed with migrants made the dangerous channel crossing today. Quite how many were on board will be published tomorrow. The figure for yesterday was 482, the highest in a single day. 
That takes the total for the year to more than 10,000. The long-running speculation about the future of the Aston Villa and England star Jack Grealish is finally over. As of tonight, he is a Manchester City player. He cost them a nice round figure, £100 million. That's a British transfer record. He said it was a dream come true to play for the best team in the country and for a manager considered the best in the world. No club in British history has ever paid as much for a footballer as Manchester City just have. So you can forgive them for eking out the drama in their big reveal on their social media channels tonight. Jack Grealish has a new haircut, a new club and a new number. For £100 million, he is City's new number 10. He joins from the club he's been at since he was a schoolboy. Aston Villa tried hard to keep their midfield talisman, but the hefty price they put on him was met by the Premier League champions. He's very much worth it. I think he's a great player, to say the least. Um, and I think as the seasons go on, he's going to prove his worth every season, every game, every time he comes on. Grealish was one of the undoubted stars of the England team in the European Championships this summer. That was despite the fact that in most of the games, he only came on as a substitute. He invariably, though, made a telling contribution, none more so perhaps than when he crossed the ball perfectly for Harry Kane's goal in that famous win against Germany. His desire to get on the ball and cause the opposition problems made him a firm favourite among England fans. That and gestures like this, when he climbed into the stand after the final to give his boots to one young supporter. Quite where Grealish will fit into the galaxy of stars at Man City will be interesting to see, but on a salary of £200,000 a week, he'd be a very expensive substitute. Geraint Vincent, News at 10. And another player whose future has been hanging in the balance is Barcelona's Lionel Messi. He appears to have parted company with a club. He it said tonight he will not be staying at Barcelona because of what it called financial and structural obstacles. The rules of the Spanish league say that to afford the wages he'd get if he signed a new contract, Barcelona would have to sell some players. The club thanked Messi for his huge contribution to its success. Finally, there were no gold medals to wake up to this morning, were there? But we need not have worried. By mid-morning, Team GB cyclist Matt Walls, an Olympics newbie, won his first in the men's Omnium event. If his name is to join the long line of British Olympic cycling champions, then it was a timely success. His roommate, Jason Kenny, who has won sprint gold since London 2012, was knocked out in the quarterfinals of his event. Team GB has, though, now won a decent 51 medals. Gold on the track once again. Usually, it doesn't take Britain's track cyclists so long to strike gold, but they finally broke their Tokyo duck today thanks to Matt Walls in the Omni. Leading going into the final of the event's four races, tactically, Walls played it perfectly and won with plenty to spare. It's pretty cool being the first, the first one to get the gold. Uh, but yeah, it's been it's been carnage basically <laughs> this uh, this Olympics and team pursuit especially. Uh, but no, yeah, it's it's really cool to come away with the gold. Jason Kenny became Britain's most decorated Olympian earlier this week with a team silver. Today he was on his own, but wasn't able to defend the sprint title he'd held since London 2012. A changing of the guard, maybe. In the white helmet, still Katie Marchant the was a big medal hope in the Kieran, but through no fault of her own, her challenge was cruelly ended when she was wiped out by Dutch rival Lorene van Riesen. Holly Bradshaw has a CV full of near misses. Could tonight at the Olympic Stadium be the night when she finally got onto the podium, outdoors on a world stage? In a nail-biting shootout, it came down to three medals between four vaulters. Bradshaw held her nerve for bronze. Britain's only other medal today was also bronze, and it came on the water. After the closest of finishes in the 200 metres kayak, Liam Heath squeezed onto the podium. With three days still to go, Team GB have matched the total number of medals they won in Beijing in 08, and they've reached that milestone without much help from two of their biggest and best-funded sports, rowing and athletics. Evidence, perhaps, that new events and new faces 
have made their mark here. Steve Scott, News at 10, Tokyo. Haven't they just? And that's all we've got time for. Thank you for being with us for tonight's News at 10. From me and everyone on the team this evening, good night.